All right, if you will open your Bibles to Jude. To Jude, of course, there's only one chapter in Jude, so Jude. We're going to begin reading in verse number one. We're not going to read the whole book like we did, or whole, the whole thing like we did last Sunday, but we're going to read verses one through four. Jude, in verse number one. When you find your place, I invite you to stand as we honor God with the reading of his word. Jude, verse number one. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for, for, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray. Father, as we are to the preaching and teaching part of the service, Father, once again, I ask that you would empty me of myself, Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin, that you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit, that I may preach, thus saith the word of the Lord. Father, as we discuss these verses, Lord, I ask that you would help us to stay focused, or that you would help us to be engaged, or that the Holy Spirit would be free, Lord, to speak to every heart and every mind that's here tonight, Lord, and that Satan would not have a foothold into to anyone's heart or mind, Lord, and we would not allow him to disrupt, Lord, via text message, social media, email, phone call, or whatever it is, Lord, that we would make your word the priority, Lord, and that we would make sure that you have free reign to speak to each and every single one of us. Lord, I ask that you would have your will and your way in the rest of the service. Father, for it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word, contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. Last week as we discussed who the letter was to and, and why he had written it. and uh, Jude, while he's wanting to write this letter and write, in writing this letter, we don't know what caused him to write the letter. There's no indication of something that happened. And when Paul writes certain letters, he, he mentions why some things are happening. But Jude, we, we don't know if he got a letter we, from a church. We don't know if he saw something or if somebody came and told him about something that's going on in a, in a church. But nonetheless, he's, he, he's, he's found it necessary to change what he was originally going to write about. And, and evidently, the, the need for this letter, uh, you know, it was something that he had to write urgently. And not only did he write urgently this letter, but he's wanting the, those in, this, in the church that, it, that this is happening to, to respond urgently. To respond urgently. And so, uh, Jude, number one, Jude, Jude's intention. His intention in verse number three is, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. He, he, his intention was to write about the common salvation. Jude wanted to write about salvation that we all have together. See, the common salvation is that, that Jude is talking about is that everyone is saved the same way. Every single person is saved the ex exact same way, through, uh, by faith through Jesus Christ. 
right? We're all saved by Jesus and, and placing our faith, our trust in him. There, listen, it doesn't matter if somebody if claims that an angel visited them and because that angel visited them that they know that they're on their way to heaven. The Bible, listen, there's no biblical authority for that. I know there's a lot of uh, Middle Eastern folks that are Muslims that have visions, but those visions that lead to faith in Christ, there's, there's those that, that leads to faith in Christ, that's salvation. So listen, he said, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation. Could it be I wanted to celebrate the salvation that we have? Uh, maybe he wanted to write a, a, a celebrational type of letter to to, or an encouragement letter, or who knows what kind of letter he wanted to write about the common salvation, but that was his intention. He had no intention in writing a call to arms. That was not his intention. And, and so we're, as we look at these two verses, I want us to understand that, that, that the, the, the heart of Jude was not to call to arms. And I want to tell you this. As a preacher, there's, there's going to be times. Now, I'm not talking about taking on arms of guns. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't misunderstand me. But there's always there's going to be times when a preacher says uh, has a call to arms that we need to contend for the faith. That we need to fight. Not with guns, right? We're talking about a spiritual battle. We're talking about... That kind of fighting, that there, there's a call to arms, so, so to speak. And so, but that was not his intention. Jude's had, too, Jude's plans changed. He says also in verse 3, It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly, that's, that, that's how we know it was urgent, to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude writes an appeal to contend for the faith. Jude gives them a, a gives the, the church there a warning, and it's a call to action. It's a call to action. We all understand a call to action. In our history, in America itself, there's always there's been several calls to action. Boston Tea Party, right? The shot that was heard around the world. There's all, there's all kinds of been in our history, in our country, calls to action. Well, Jude here is giving the church a call to action. He's almost like give, giving a military call and saying, you, you need to be ready. We, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. What must we do to be faithful to this call? And what, as a church today, and what was the church that he was writing to, what must that church and our church today, what must we do to be faithful to this call, this call to contend for the faith or to contend for the truth? Because that's what he's calling them to, to contend for the truth. So Jude gives himself as an example Jude not only calls the church to contend, but he himself is contending for the faith because, listen, I don't, I wouldn't think that myself that, that being inspired that Jude would write this and he himself not doing the same thing. So he, he, he's, he, he's trying to let them know that he himself is fighting and that they need to fight. But look, I want you to look at Jude's attitude, at his attitude towards the church in writing this letter. His attitude towards the church is love. Because in verse number 3, the first word is what? Beloved. It's the beloved of God. So he call, his attitude towards the church in calling them uh, to contend, a uh, call to arms, is love. He's like, beloved of God. See, Paul wrote something similar to the elders in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, he's writing to the, he, he's talking about the, uh, to, he's talking to the elders in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says this, Take heed therefore unto yourselves. 
And to all the flock over the over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, he goes, take heed over the entire flock. You elders in Ephesus, take heed over the entire flock that, the, that God has given you and has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased in his what? With his own blood. So Paul is saying, telling the, the, the elders in Ephesus, you need to take heed for yourself because, listen, the, the church that God has made you overseers of, he's the one who purchased it. So you need to take heed, therefore. And, and so uh, as he, and there's a whole there in, in, chapters, in chapter 20 about the apostle Paul talking to the church of Ephesus and the elders there. And Jude here, as he's writing this, he was compelled with urgency. Jude felt it was his duty to write unto the church with urgency to contend for the faith, to contend for the truth. That's that. We, we know that because he uses the word earnestly. See, the church, the Jude says the church is responsible for the truth. Do you understand that? The church that Jude's writing to and the God wrote about this church, we are responsible for the truth. We have the truth. Is that not the unadulterated English version of the Bible that we have in our hands? If it is, and you believe it to be the Word of God, you are responsible for the contending for the truth. Because I don't know if you know this, or not, you should, but there are false teachers in Houston. There are false teachers in Baytown. And we need to take responsibility for the truth. He said, church, you're responsible for the truth. That's why he's saying, since you're responsible for the truth, you need to earnestly contend for the faith. Because, let, let, let's be honest. If someone was spreading a lie about your spouse or your, your children, what would you do? Would you take responsibility? Would you contend for the, tr the, the truth? Come on! If you won't, you're, if you won't, you're a coward. And I want to say this, if you won't contend for the, the tr contend for the truth of the Word of God, you're a coward. You're a coward if, you're, if you won't take responsibility for the Word of God. And so here, what the, this is what Jude is saying. He, he has urgency. He says, I, I, I write unto you, I, I, I'm exhorting you to earnestly contend for the faith. You need to fight for the truth. Well, Brother Mark, you know, I'm not the pastor. It doesn't matter. He's writing to believers. He's writing to a church. He didn't say at the beginning, did he, to, uh, to the pastor. That's not what he wrote, is it? He says, to you that are called, sanctified, preserved, that's, that's every believer. So he's calling to arms this church. Then he gives us the reason why. He gives the reason why in verse 4. He says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude's warning. And the reason he's calling them to arms is because men who came into the church with immoral living. Listen, listen you want to know their doctrine? Know their living. Hello? The way they believe is the way they live. The way they live is the way they believe. And so this, we, we know it's because these men who have crept into this church that he's writing to, uh, and maybe not even this church, but other churches that who have gotten this letter, the, he, there's men there who have crept in who, who say that they, that they believe Jesus is the Son of God. They say that, they, that they're saved, but in reality, they're out there living immoral, lascivious lives.
That's what that word lascivious means. means. Immoral, immorality. They're out there living in, in adultery and fornication and lust. And he says these men have crept in unawares and they're living an immoral life. To Jude, this is a life and death situation. Why? Immorality can destroy a church. Sin will destroy a church. Hello? And so to Jude, this is a life or death situation. Can I ask you this, men? Is God's worth not worth being courageous for? Is God's word not worth being courageous for? If you're a coward, it's not. No, it's worth being courageous for. We have a history of men who stood up for the truth, who were burned alive at the stake. Don't think that's just our history and it won't happen again in this country. It's going to happen again. Jude's warning is because of false teachers who are living immoral and lives and denying Jesus as the Savior and God being the one true God. He says, listen, you, you, these men, they're, they're coming into the church and they're saying this and they're saying that and they're, living, and they're, they're, they're not living a life that uh, honors God. They're not work, walking worthy of the vocation uh, uh, of their calling. You, know, you got these men, they're doing this. And listen, I don't know if, if you've ever done this. As if you're a teenager, maybe you've never come across this. But as the church, someday you will, you will have or already have come in contact with apostasy and heresy. Right? I don't, listen, we, we, we're, we live in a day where we as a church have come in contact with apostasy and heresy. Turn on TBN, you will see apostasy and heresy. You will. I don't know if you've ever attended a church where heresy is being preached or, her or apostasy is being taught. All you got to do is watch Elevation Church, Bethel Church, Hillsong. It's all you, got, you, got, all you, you can watch those you can, and you will see that there's heresy being taught. And, and, and here... He's giving warning to this church about heresy and apostasy and, and, and adulterous lifestyle that these men are living. And when this happens, the church must take up the call and call it out. Hello? The church must step up. And call it out and take upon this call to earnestly contend for the faith. Brother Steve, I don't know if you've ever seen this in a race. Where, you know, whether it's the 100 meter relay, 400 meter relay, 200 meter relay. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I've never seen it. I've heard it's been done, but I've never seen it myself. Where the race begins, the runner takes off, passes the, bas the baton to the second guy. Second guy is running full. The third guy starts turning, and he, and, it, and he passes the baton to the third guy. And as the third guy is running around, the, turning the corner, and getting ready to pass on to the fourth guy. The fourth guy takes it, takes off running, stops, and goes, walks into the infield and sits down. You ever seen that happen? We cannot take the baton and walk into the infield. We have to run this race. The baton is it. What's the baton? It's the word of God that you have in your lap. It's the faith. It's the truth that was committed to you. Right? So if the word of God has been in the faith has been committed to you, that has been handed down, that was the, what is the verse saying? That was given, that was given to who? The saints. 
That's what it says, right? You can't take the baton and then go sit down. Take responsibility for the truth. Take responsibility uh, for the faith. You see heresy. You see apostasy. You take up the call and contend for the truth. You call it out. That's what Jude is saying here. Jude's warning is because our life is not a playground, it's a battleground. Folks, our, our life is not a battle, it's not a playground to where we can go and hang out on the monkey bars. Go slide down the slide and play hopscotch. That's not our life. That's not, that's not why we're here. We're on a battleground. We are fighting a spiritual warfare. The church is not a cruise ship. It's the battleship. And we all need to be at our stations ready for battle. How did Pearl Harbor get taken over? Pearl Harbor became a playground, not a battleground. Until, listen, until the crisis came. It wasn't until the bombs started dropping that they ran to their stations. Now, I get it. it you know, they didn't have the technology. They couldn't see, but... And I'm not a historian in Pearl Harbor, and I'm not a historian in that... But when you're not ready, when you're not ready to contend, you will fall. I'm a Mike Tyson fan. I'm not none of his life of his fighting. Mike Tyson fought a lot of men that were not ready to face him. And if you're not ready to contend for the faith, you will fall. And Jude here is giving this warning to the church there that he's writing to that we need to take that same warning. Every letter, listen, every letter we have in this book, every letter we have in the New Testament to the churches, there are letters because there's challenges and there's struggles that need to be addressed. Why did Paul write to the Galatians? Because they left their first love. They, they left the gospel, and but not the, not the gospel, but another gospel, which was a fake gospel. Why did he write to the church of Corinth? Because there were problems in the church. Why did he write to the book of uh, to the church of Ephesus? Because listen, if they were, he was trying to describe who Jesus was, and then later he says, because Jesus is who he is, you're able to do this, and you need to put on the whole armor of God. You, 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 your husbands, you need to act right. You need to love your wives, women, ladies, wives. You need to love your husbands. You need to respect. Your husband, there's all in every book there's issues and there's there's things that need to be addressed. So why do we think now that we don't have to worry about these things and, and uh, uh, worry about address, these addresses or, or or things that's going on? No, we need to contend for the faith today. It's not a playground, we're on the battleground. Because if you don't think Satan would do what is necessary to kill a church. You're naive or you're blind. Contending for the faith. Paul, listen, Paul warned Timothy of this. And we're to take the same Warning, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Paul warned Timothy, and we need to take that same warning. Take the warning from Jude. Contend for the truth. 
Tim, the warning to Timothy that Paul gave him. Listen, you better watch it. You're going to have these men. There's going to be times when these you, the folks in your church are not going to want to listen to sound doctrine. They're not going to want to listen to truth, but they're going to want to listen to chicken soup for the soul. They're going to want to hear about uh, this new movie of, uh, of the chosen or uh, uh, of this or that. They're going to want to hear about the newest and greatest thing. They're not going to want to listen to sound doctrine. No, but that's what you need. It's what I need. I need the truth. I need sound doctrine preached unto me. Why? Because I'm a sinner. I contend with the flesh every single day. And I need the truth in my life to shine the light on sin that's in my heart and it's in my life. I need sound doctrine. Oh, it would be nice. Listen, it would be nice just to just to try to you know, to preach what I think the Word of God should be. It would be nice to make the Word of God an allegory, an allegory, and just pretend that it is that it's saying something that it's really not. It'd be easy to be a Democrat to take the word out of context. And say, well, that's just you took that out of context. This is what I meant. No, the Word of God is very clear. It'd be nice not to have responsibility. It'd be very nice not to have to have responsibility. But no, I have warning that I'm content to contend for the truth. Folks, we n now need to contend for the faith, the truth, because Satan will use whatever is necessary to get you off the path of following Jesus by faith, including justifying your sin because of God's grace. Verse number what does he say here? Number four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of, or, uh, of, before of old or, of ordained uh, to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into what? You know what? Uh, you can, listen, you have the liberty to do whatever, uh, to sin. Why? Because you are under grace. Because of the grace of God. Satan will do whatever is necessary for you to, to, to get you off the path to steal your children and your grandchildren away from the faith because, well, I like to blank. And you can justify it while I'm under the, gra I'm under the grace. Listen, the Lord knows my heart. He knows my heart. He knows I, I don't do that, but you know, it's really not that bad. It's not that bad. It took one eating one, a bite out of one piece of fruit to, ca to cast mankind into depravity. It's not that bad. Really? S Satan will do whatever is necessary to get you off, away from following Jesus being faithful to him and serving him in church, and he will use whatever sin you like. Whatever sin you like. Folks, if we're not active at our battle stations on the battleship of the church, we'll become sluggards. You will become, we will become sluggards of the faith. And when we need to arise and contend for the faith, we'll fall. When we're not at our battle stations, we become spiritually lazy. That's what a sluggard is. Lazy. Right? And when the fight comes, you won't be ready. You will fall and be washed out with a rip current, uh, with a rip tide of sin. You'll be, you'll be gone. 
Look around. Look next to you. Look around. Folks who used to be in church are not in church anymore. Why? They, got slu they became sluggards in their faith, spiritually lazy, and a burden came. You hear me? A burden came, and they fell. And now either because they're so deep in sin they have no desire to go to church anymore or they're too shameful to think in that we as a church, we're going to judge them. No. We're going to be happy they're back. We're going to celebrate that they're back in church, that they're here. And we're going to act like nothing ever happened. Why? Because we love them. But no, if, you, if you're not at your battle stations, prepared for this spiritual war, and the burden comes, you'll fall. Sluggery, sluggardry, I, I, I made up this word, it's not a word. Slugger, uh, sluggardry happens when we're not, dilig not diligent in acting early. Sluggardry happens when we don't act early. I have a couple of levers here. Okay? And this, these levers are called a mechanically, uh, a, mecha a mechanically advantage. It's a mechanical advantage. See, when you're a spiritual sluggard, when... You're not at your battle stations and you're not prepared for the spiritual war. When a burden comes up or a crisis, because this, this is about 100 pounds here, the pennies. When the burden comes or a crisis comes because you're a sluggard and you need to act, what happens? Where's the burden go? Stays. Why? Because I got time. I, listen, this is this is a, an illustration I got from the men's advance, and it was a great illustration. You know, my child, she's a teenager now, and you know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen years old. Ah, she's not really interested in boys. I got time, 18 years old. Hello? You were spiritually sluggard. You didn't prepare your teenager. I got time. Interested in the wrong kind of man, wrong kind of boy. Your burden's there. You can do nothing with it, and you're in a crisis mode. They said something in the men's advance that that they say that, they, that that made sense. There's a lot of men that say this. There's a lot of people, not just men, say, I perform well when I'm under the gun. No, you don't. Not the spiritual war, you're not. The spiritual war, you will not perform well when a crisis hits and you're not, you haven't been giving diligence. It's the battle station. Right? But if you make the decision not to be a sluggard, if you make a decision, you know what? One day I'm going to be tested. One day a burden's going to come, a crisis is going to come. And you know, I need to be in battle station. I need to be in battle mode because you know. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't have a clue what it's going to be. It could be my, uh, my teenage daughter, granddaughter getting pregnant. It could be fornication, adultery. I don't know what it could be. But one day a crisis is going to come. And if I'm a sluggard, it's going to be really hard. But if I'm at my battle stations, 
at the battleship of the church, preparing for war. Hey, Pinky. How easy is that burden? It takes 250 pounds of pressure to pick up a 100-pound load. Oh, I got time. No, you don't. You don't know when Satan's going to attack. Oh, I got, listen, it doesn't, listen, I, listen, I'm going to be ready. No, you're not, not, listen, not if you're not preparing early. If you're not preparing early for the burden, for the crisis that Satan's wanting to bring. Hello? It's awfully quiet in here. I'm hoping this is hitting home. More people are dropping out of church than joining. Folks. Why? Because they think they can handle this when they need to be preparing for that with this. You think how you think listen, this is a lever. The longer the lever, the less amount of force or strength that you need. Hey, Connor, come here. Connor's what, five? Five years old. Almost six, right? Five years old. Grab this. Pull it down, Connor. You don't have to have, when you prepare, when you prepare at your battle stations and you're ready for war and the crisis comes, you don't need much. You don't need much. We say, well, what, what, what our church, don't, we don't have men that's crept in underwear. No, but your heart does. Your heart has things that are creeping into your heart. And well, I, listen, I, I don't have to go to, listen, I don't have to, I have baseball tonight. Listen, I have baseball practice. I have dance recital. I have this, I have that. Well, when the burden comes and you're not where you're supposed to be, you're not a, you're, you're not a strong Christian, and instead of being where you're supposed to be, you're at baseball practice, football practice, NASCAR race, your heart and your, bur- your crisis is here, and you can do nothing about it. You're not prepared because you're not where you're spo- you have not been where you have spo- were supposed to have been. So go ahead and think that you can handle it. You know, it, but Steve, it'd be nice if believers would let their pastor speak into their life instead of getting mad when they're told the truth because one day the burden and the crisis is going to come they're going to come to me help I wish I could I wish I could but unfortunately all them Sundays and Wednesdays that you should have been paying attention He wasn't. I'll pray for you. I love you. I'll pray for you, but I don't know how to help you now. Folks, I'm not trying to be mean, mean mean-spirited. I hate mean-spirited preaching. I try my best not to be that way. But beloved, the time's coming. How about this? The wolves are coming. The crises, they're coming. Which mechanical advantage do you want? Prepared? I have time. The choice is yours. It's always been yours. 
a dam, uh, a dam that holds water doesn't just all of a sudden give way. No, years of erosion, years of constant pressure is what causes the dam to burst. The wolves are coming. The crises are coming. The question is, will you take responsibility now before they get here? Will you contend for the faith? Will you contend for your own faith? Because Satan is coming and attacking. And he will use whatever sin you want to what the, that you're willing to use to justify whatever excuse you're willing to use to justify your sin he will come and he will give it to you to keep you out of church to keep you away uh, from following after Jesus by faith so you're no longer a threat to his kingdom that's his goal to kill steal and to destroy <coughs> It's your choice. Contend for the faith or fall. Because you did not want to take responsibility. Prepare to contend now because it's all coming. Father,